Good afternoon. Pull the mic. <coughs> you are a Dockers a Geek Award, Senior Council EBS OGW. Yes, Honorable Speaker, sir. Welcome to this committee. This is a parliamentary committee on appointments. It will engage you this afternoon to assess and recommend your suitability or otherwise in holding office to which His Excellency the President has nominated you as the Attorney General of the Republic of Kenya, the ninth Attorney General. Uh, before we engage, we'll introduce ourselves to you. I'm the Chairman of this committee, the Speaker of the National Assembly. On my right is the Deputy Speaker, Gladys Boss. On my left is the Clerk of the National Assembly, Samuel Injiroge. I'll invite members of the committee to introduce themselves. Naisula Lesuda, MP Samburu West. Kimani Shongo. Junet Mohammed. David Kosing, my name, MP Poko South. Gikaria David. Masemer Teso South. Abdul Rahim Daud, Nodi Menti Meru. George Gitonga Murugara, Faraka, Faraka Nifi. Owen Bayer, Kilifi North. Robert Mbui Kadiani. Stephen Mule, Matungulu. Didoraso uh, Saku. Abdishurie Balambala. Mishimboko Likoni. Adihab Mukami, Nyeri County. Thank you. Nominee, you will be, for purpose of these proceedings, you will be referred to as nominee. Understood, sir. Uh, we will take your interaction with us on oath. So I invite you to choose, depending on your faith, whether you need the Bible, the Holy Quran, or the Gita. That is the Holy Book of the Hindus. Which one is in line with your faith? The Bible. The Holy Bible. So you may be upstanding. Take the Bible in your right hand and recite the oath that will be available to you. I Move closer to the mic so that it goes on record. I, Dorcas Agik Odum Odwar, do swear that the evidence I shall give before this committee on the matter under its consideration shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you. Take your seat and sign to the oath. your documents to the sergeant to pass to the clerk so that he can be able to check against what we have on you. Nominee, I'll now, you're ready? You are ready? Yes, I am, honorable speaker. Thank you, honorable members, for the record. I know the nominee very well. In my long years of practice of the law, we have interacted with the nominee when she worked in the Attorney General's Chambers in the old constitution and after her transition to the new constitution. She's somebody we've worked with in cases sometimes on the same side, sometimes on opposite sides. That notwithstanding, it will not impair my ability to engage her, to find her suitability or otherwise. Uh, nominee Dokas, we invite you to introduce yourself by telling this committee your name, your educational background, your work experience, and above all, 
your competences that you make you think you are suitable to hold the office to which you have been nominated for consideration for appointment. Honorable Speaker. In five sir. minutes. Honorable Speaker, sir, I had prepared an opening statement to introduce myself. May I proceed? Go ahead. I'll give you room to do that. It's less than five minutes? It will be. Okay. Honorable Speaker, sir, honorable, honorable members of the Committee on Appointments, my name is Dorcas Agik Odung Odur. I'm privileged to appear before you today for the purpose of being vetted for the position of Attorney General of this great Republic of Kenya. This is as required under Article 156, sub Article 2 of the Constitution of Kenya. Honorable speakers and honorable members, I'm deeply, deeply humbled by the confidence and trust which His Excellency the President, Dr. William Samuel Ruto, has shown and placed in me by nominating me to this position. It is also not lost on me that this is a historic moment in that this will be the first time for a Kenyan woman to be interviewed for this high office in the legal sector. I'm therefore under no illusion that should I be approved by this August House, much would be expected of me, both as a jurist and more significantly as a woman. Mr. Speaker, and honorable members, it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge the fact that in essence, I do not stand here alone. I stand on the shoulders of many people of goodwill and I'm a beneficiary of their generous support and mentorship. Their knowledge and wisdom over the years has shaped me into the person I am today. Honorable speakers and members, for my secondary school education, I attended Luak Girls High School, after which I read law at the University of Nairobi. Thereafter, I gained a postgraduate diploma from the Kenya School of Law. I subsequently attended a Master's of Arts degree at my alma mater, the University of Nairobi. I have also other certificates and commendations from other relevant professional leadership, management, and other training institutions over the years. Mr. Speaker, sir, and honorable members of this committee, all this I have set in the CV that I have submitted to you. Honorable speakers and members, my legal career started in 1992 when I was admitted to the role of advocates of the High Court of Kenya. I was then employed and served in the state law office, rising from the position of state counsel to the position of secretary of public prosecutions, and that was in 2017. This was as a result of the delinking of the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions from the Office of the Attorney General by the Constitution of Kenya 2010. I have gained extensive experience and expertise throughout that period. Not only have I been involved in many complex courtroom and high profile cases, I've also made significant contributions in the formulation of policy and other protocols relevant to the rule of law human rights, crime prevention, locally, regionally, and internationally. This included service in various task forces, commissions of inquiry, and similar bodies and committees. I've outlined this in the dossier I have provided to this honorable committee. Mr. Speaker, son, honorable members, I'm alive to the enormity of the responsibility reposed in the office of the Attorney General of the Republic by the Constitution of Kenya. It is no mean task that the Attorney General is the principal legal advisor to the government. The Constitution also mandates the office to promote, protect, and uphold the rule of law and to defend the public interest. While these high legal concepts are still evolving through the growing jurisprudence in our courts and elsewhere, they nonetheless require of this office a vibrant awareness of the human rights ecosystem within the legal framework. It is therefore my respectful opinion, honorable speaker and members, 
that the position of the Attorney General calls for far much more than just that of an advocate for one client. The public interest demands of the office the duty to respect, advocate, and operationalize at all cadres of the administration this cardinal value of justice. In the circumstances, Mr. Speaker, sir, and honorable members, I would submit that we stand at a unique moment in our constitutional dispensation. It calls for the qualities of listening and learning. Should this house confirm me, I would be determined as a matter of priority to pay attention to those two qualities. Not having occupied the position, position of the Attorney General before, I would obviously benefit from the strengths and victories of my predecessors. I would also seek to collaborate with other persons and agencies to enhance any aspect of the vision and mission of this office, which may still require revitalization. My bounden duty would have to be the delivery of sound, honest, and objective legal advice to the government in accordance with the Constitution of Kenya and my oath of office. Additionally, it will demand proactiveness in the attainment of other core responsibilities in the public interest. All stakeholders in the justice sector have no less duty than that. Accordingly, Mr. Speaker and members, for me, working together will not be an option, but an imperative. Mr. Speaker, sir, and honorable members of this committee, in my years of schooling and work, one signal lesson has been imprinted into my intellect and conscience. It is simply this, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with my God. That is recorded in the book of Mika, 6-8 by Prophet Mika. That is a statement to the fact that I should never take my abilities or capacity for granted, nor should I think low of others. Ultimately, my strength and eventual success may well depend on the counsel and industry of those around me. Honorable Speaker, sir, and members, for that reason, in my respectful view, teamwork will always be key, and I would propose to enhance the same. To that end, Mr. Speaker, sir, and honorable members, I dutifully submit myself to you to this interview. Thank you. Thank you, nominee. I'll now invite the David Speaker to be the first to ask you a question or comment. And when questions are asked, be concise and precise in your answers. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Um, the nominee, Dokas Agik Odwar, uh, all of us in the legal fraternity know that you have previously worked at the state law office uh, and the prosecution department. I think mostly people know you as that, as per your CV also. And when the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution was delinked from the Office of the Attorney General in 2010, you transitioned to the Office of the DPP, where you were serving as the second most senior person as Secretary Public Prosecution. Could you share with this committee what you consider was your greatest achievements in, in the 30 years in your public service? And secondly, if approved as Attorney General, like you rightfully said, you will make history as the first woman attorney general. Like myself, all the women in the legal fraternity have high expectations of you as one of the most senior women in the legal fraternity. In this regard, tell us what you'd consider to be your vision of the office of the attorney general should you be approved. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. I joined the office of the Attorney General in 1992, and I would divide my achievements in, from the office of the Attorney General and the office of the DPP into four sectors. When I joined in 1992, for the first eight years, I was a courtroom lawyer. 
I prosecuted all manner of cases in all courts to the highest court. The epitome of that was in 2000, when I was nominated to go and assist Kenya in prosecuting the 1998 bomb blast victims, a case in New York. And we successfully did that. Another epitome of my court work was the case that I prosecuted against. It is known as the Gachanja case. The reason why it is my achievement, it is the first time that a prosecutor was able to forfeit instruments of crime and proceeds of crime. In that matter, one of the accused persons had been paid by a piece of land in order to commit murder. And I successfully forfeited what he was paid. That matter went up to the Supreme Court and it was upheld. My third success in court would be the case of Chris Okemo on extradition. There was a conflict between the Office of the Attorney General and the Office of the DPP as to whose responsibility it is to sign authority to proceed. I did prosecute that case, litigated it, because it was a civil case now, it was a constitutional petition. I did litigate it in the High Court and the Court of Appeal. I filed responses in the Supreme Court. My colleague prosecuted it at the Supreme Court and we were su successful. That matter is now settled, that it is the responsibility of the Director of Public Prosecutions to sign the authority to proceed. That is in the courtroom, among others. While serving in the office of the AG and the DPP, I was able to participate, humbly so, I was appointed by different heads of state in this country to serve in commissions and task forces. I served in the Akiwimi Commission on land clashes, and it is after we had submitted our report that we started land reforms in this country. I served in the Goldenberg Commission, and it is after we submitted our report that we re-looked at our PFM Act. I served in the Police Task Force on Police Reforms, and it is the result of that task force that we now have IPOA, we have the Police Service Commission, we have the IG as a single command of the police and the AP, we also have the, we have the merger of the Kenya police and the APs and a single command. Other than task forces within the country, I have contributed internationally in different fora. My first contribution was with the Commonwealth Court Secretariat. I was called in as an expert to review the Harare scheme on mutual legal assistance. It is after my contribution to the COMSEC and successful review of that mutual legal assistance scheme that I came back and proposed to Kenya that we needed a mutual legal assistance act. The Kenya government agreed and we came up with an act and that is the act we are dealing with today, the Mutual Legal Assistance Act. Secondly, I have done a lot of work with the FATF. FATF is Financial Action Task Force. It is a group of G7 and other countries. They set standards on issues of money laundering and asset forfeiture. I am a trained evaluator. I've evaluated two countries, one in Africa and one in Europe, on compliance with the 40 recommendations. It is after my contribution to that forum that I came back to get Kenya together with my colleagues and we assisted in legislation of POCAMLA, which is Proceeds of Crime and Anti-Money Laundering. It is also after that that we assisted with the legislation of Terrorism Finance Act. A product of that is the FIU, the Financial Reporting Unit, the Asset Recovery Agency, and the National Task Force. I've also done some work with the UN. And at the UN, I assisted Kenya when we were negotiating the United Nations Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime. I also took part in the evaluation of that convention. I was again called in as an expert to make a digest which I provided. And in that digest, I am an expert in piracy. Uh, after that, the United Nations accredited me as a trainer 
in that space. I've also done some work with AGA Africa. AGA Africa is a conglomeration of attorney generals. As the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions, we collaborated with them and we have all the black attorney generals in the USA in that forum. They have assisted the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions in many areas and they have exposed and assisted the DPP to operationalize the PTI. Other than those, I have done work with GIZ with regard to illicit financial flows. Incidentally, when I heard of my nomination, I was representing Kenya in, at the UN headquarters to take part in the final negotiation of the amendments of the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime to include issues of, of electronic evidence and data protection. That was the last uh, call for countries to give their views before the amendments are adopted. And I am hoping that after this um, initiative, Kenya will accede to the Budapest Convention to bridge the gap we have in electronic evidence and data protection. Allow me, Mr. Speaker, sir, to go back to the Office of the Attorney General and the Office of the DPP. I have served in that office in different capacities. I have acted as the DPP in three, uh, during three transitions, but now I am the Secretary of Public Prosecutions. When we delinked from the Office of the Attorney General, we had only 98 prosecution council, and we were in, tw in 12 regional offices. It was then my responsibility together with the DPP to rationalize staff and to operationalize the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. We have managed to increase the staff of the Office of the DPP from 98 to 1,600. We have managed to decentralize the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions from 12 offices to all the 47 counties to 131 court stations, and we also serve mobile courts. We have also managed during that period to civilize prosecution. What do I mean by this? Initially, police prosecutors were prosecuting in all courts. When we took over, we professionalized prosecution. We no longer have police prosecutors in our courtrooms. This is being done by prosecution counsel. Other than that, when Mr. Haji took over the helm of the director of public prosecutions, he found when we had an initiative where we were looking at the position or the contribution of the criminal justice sector to the development of this country and how the Department of Public Prosecutions or the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution were, was assisting or impeding the realization of the objectives of this country. We therefore, I therefore together with others, started an initiative called All for Justice. And All for Justice, we wanted to look at the role the prosecution is playing in realizing the objectives of the criminal justice sector. We visited almost all the prisons in Kenya. We interviewed about 20,000 prisoners. And honorable speaker and members, I really wonder what led us to do this because looking back, I realized that somebody was directing my steps. Because the conclusion of that report which I have here today indicated that what the prosecution wanted to do could not be done by the prosecution but could only be done by the Attorney General. And I want to run over four of them. When we went through the 20,000 uh, inmates, pretrial inmates, and we checked all the prisons in Kenya, it was a wonder that although under the Constitution we talk about innocent and less proven guilty, it was clear that our criminal justice system is inconsistent with the right of innocence until proven guilty. Why do I say that? 
we found that most of the people who were in custody were in custody for petty offenses. There was nothing we could do because the law provided for them. Then we realized that there is a need for us to relook at our offenses in Kenya so that we can decriminalize petty offenses. At the same time, there is a need for us to find a different way of dealing with petty offenses. So we made that recommendation to the Office of the Attorney General. We also found that most of the people who were in custody were young people and they were poor. There was no mechanism that these people could be assisted. Each time they went to court, they needed bail and bail is in cash. So we asked ourselves, is cash the only way that we can secure the attendance of accused persons to court? We made the recommendation to the NCAJ and we're waiting for the Attorney General to attend to it. Secondly, or thirdly, we also found that most of the people who were in custody were not represented. There was no equality of arms. They could not defend themselves. We made a recommendation to the Attorney General that there was a need to operationalize the legal aid services. Because when people are not represented, they are not able to move through the system. And honorable members and Mr. Speak and Mr. Speaker, sir, I would invite you people to visit our pretrial detentions. We talk about rights. We talk about the rights of the arrested, the rights of the accused persons, the rights of the detained person, but we have not made it tangible. Because if you visit these institutions, you will wonder what we, were, we are as Kenya. None of the people charged with corruption of cases was in pretrial detention. It is only the poor. They have no food. They have no classes. Cases take very long. And most people who should be in custody are walking outside. And most people who should be outside are in custody. There is a need for us to reform the criminal justice sector. We also observed that cases were taking very long. And there was a need for us to expedite those cases through the system. As a result of that, DPP Haji, myself, and the office tried to come up with initiatives within our power. And that is why we came up with the decision to charge guidelines. The decision to, and that is one of my biggest achievements, our biggest achievement. The decision to charge guidelines is supposed to regulate how we make the decision to charge so that we save the system, petty cases do not go to court. We also came up with the diversion guidelines. And the diversion guidelines is supposed to attend to alternatives to prosecutions. Because we realize that not everybody who is charged with an offense should go through the system. And that was said by Sir Shawcross, the Attorney General of England in 1950. That not in all cases where you have evidence, people should go through court. So we came up with a diversion guideline to assist us to see the cases. What is the challenge that the DPP could not deal with that the Attorney General should deal with? A prosecutor could decide to divert, but where are the structures to divert to? Because if I have young people who have been brought to me and I realize that they can be rehabilitated, I need a rehabilitation center. I need counseling services. How many of our counties have rehabilitation centers and have counseling facilities? Therefore, our action is in futility. Prosecutors are being accused of taking many cases to court. It is because we have initiatives, but we need other structures of government to assist us to realize those initiatives. Could wind up on that? Yes. And uh, we also found that most of our prosecutors had no capacity, and therefore maybe were making wrong decisions. And that is the reason why in order to harness and structure the training of prosecutors, we came up with the Prosecution Training Institute. At the Prosecution Training Institute, we now have a fully-fledged court where prosecutors can undertake continuous legal uh, training, specialized training, and also training on emerging crimes. We hope that the Prosecution Training Institute will be a center for the region and will bring ANA to this country. 
On access to justice, we found that prosecutors were having a difficulty in attending court. We therefore digitized. We have word deliverable. Most processes within the office of the DPP are digitized. In order to enhance access to justice, we, together with the EU, got a boat to help us to attend to uh, courts that are outside uh, the normal courts, that is in Lamu. And it is also pursuant to that initiative that we came up with community initiatives where we would go to the community and have community dialogues so that we can tell them about their rights and the criminal justice sector. And it is also pursuant to that that we did another research on traffic to find why it is impacting the criminal justice sector. We find that it is clogging the criminal justice sector. Most of the cr crimes that we arrest people for are non-moving and they are petty like not wearing a uniform and touting. And it is for that reason that the Director of Public Prosecutions directed that touting should not be charged so that we don't clog the system. I have put all that before you. Yes. And at an appro appropriate time, if I'm nominated, I intend to You've use... You've been nominated if you are found if suitable. If I am found suitable, Honorable Speaker, sir, and members, yes. this experience will help me to oversee and to steer the office of the Attorney General. Thank you. Ichungwa, Majority Leader. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, allow me to also say I'm not the nominee. I have worked with her when I was the Vice Chair of the Public Investments Committee when she was in the Attorney General Chambers. And uh, Honorable Speaker, maybe to start with, her name Agik, I'm told, means I have arrived. Is that so? That is correct. Sir. So, <laughs> having <laughs> having started <laughs> having started your career at the Attorney General's Chambers as a State Council, probably you have arrived uh, as AG nominee. Uh, but uh, we just changed the law for the Attorney General, the Attorney General Act. Uh, I think about three or four months ago, and we now gave the AG power to recruit you and appoint your own state council. And like before, where you had to go through the Public Service Commission, no one, I would like to hear your view on whether that was a good thing uh, to do or if you feel probably those powers should have been left because of the tussle between the office of the AG and the Public Service Commission. The Public Service Commission insisting that they should continue appointing or rather recruiting staff and across the entire public service. I would just want to hear your view on that, whether it's good to have those powers in the AG or whether that should be reviewed uh, to take the powers back uh, for recruitment back to the Public Service Commission. Two, I want to hear if, since this is a law now, and uh, government has lost quite a number of cases largely on account of the caliber of staff that are there in the Attorney General's chambers in terms of the State Council. Many do not um, turn up in court and many cases are lost in court. That has occasioned the uh, uh, government uh, uh, losing many cases in court and some that are very costly to taxpayers. I think if you were to accumulate the total number of uh, judgments against government in terms of quantum of amounts that ought to be paid by government, they would run into the trillions. Um, I want to hear what is it that you intend to do should you be approved. One, to make sure that you are able to retain, to recruit and retain good state council because the Attorney General Chambers also has become a training ground for uh, uh, council. They come there, train for a few years, and they are approached by parliament, they are approached by ministries and other organizations. What will you do to retain good state council so that government doesn't continue losing cases in court? Go ahead, answer those two. Thank you, Honorable Speaker, sir, and members. With regard to delinking, I am the wrong person to ask because I fully support this. And this is what has helped the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. When we were delinked from the Office of the Attorney General, the ODPP Act, the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions Act, which operationalized 
Article 157 of the Constitution provided for a board which is chaired by the DPP and the mandate of this board is to advise the DPP on recruitment discipline of council. Why this is a good idea, it gave us the opportunity of relooking at our establishment so that we could get the necessary skills and the requisite officers to propel the office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. I am the secretary to that board and I know what we have achieved. We have increased our establishment, we have been able to rationalize our staff, we have been able to negotiate for our staff. As we speak today, it is the office of the DPP that negotiated with SRC to allow lawyers in government to earn what we call in the ODPP prosecution allowance and in the office of the Attorney General it's called another allowance which is different from non-practicing allowance and this is to help retain officers. At the same time, it is within that board which I serve as a secretary that we were able to find ways of complying with the constitution. We therefore rationalize staff. If you go to the office of the Director of Public Prosecutions today, we have 60% women, 40% men. It is the face of Kenya. We have tried to recruit from every part of this country. Secondly, the board has also helped us with issues of discipline because they go quickly and we are able to conclude them within time. Third, the board has assisted because the DPP is required on any other matter to consult the board. So necessarily when it warrants, we go back to the board to get counsel on issues of human resource. And it is through that that we have relooked at our human resource manuals, we have looked at our transfer policy, we have also relooked at our work environment. And the beauty of the board is that the public, the um, PS Treasury is represented, that is at the ODPP's office, the PS Treasury is represented, the Attorney General is represented, the Judiciary is represented, the Kenya Police is represented, the Law Society is represented, so there is collegiality and we are able to share our expertise and experience on how we can work together as a chain. The second question was a comment on government losing cases and what I would do. Mr. Speaker, son, members, there are reasons why people lose cases, not only the government. All of us lose cases one time or another for maybe these three reasons. One, it could be that you have a bad case. You will lose it. It could be that you have bad representation or inadequate representation. You could do that. You could also lose a case because the court has erred. In which case, if you feel aggrieved, you will go back to court, either for appeal or revision. You could also lose a case for any other reason. Any other reason, none of the above. So what I would do, if I'm losing a case because I have a bad case, it would be my responsibility as the Attorney General to make sure that before we go to court, I relook at the cases that we have. I try to mitigate the risk of going to court. And if possible, if I have a bad case, try to find other mechanisms of resolving the issue without going to court and incurring expenses to the government. And going forward, I would also say that it will be the responsibility of the Attorney General to advise ministries and MDAs on how they should um, deal with court matters such that the Attorney General is involved from the beginning. That is if I have a bad case. If I have inadequate or insufficient representation, I'll look at my capacity and the expertise that I have within the Office of the Attorney General. And this is exactly what we did in the Office of the DPP because initially we had private counsel assisting us, but with the time we looked at the capacities that we have. We have to enhance the capacity of our state council, not only legally, but also their working environment and their terms and conditions of service. 
And we would also want to make sure that there is continuity and succession within the office of the Attorney General. If I lose a case because the court has erred, I will go back to court on appeal on those issues. I may also go back to court on revision on issues that I think warrant revision. So going forward, if I am confirmed to this position, I will make sure that if I have a bad case, I look for mitigating factors, I do a risk assessment so that I protect the government. If I have insufficient or inadequate representation, I will make sure that wherever the government is to be defended in court, we have the correct people defending the government, we put our, put our foot forward, and we act in the interest of justice. If I lose a case for any other reason, I have recourse to go to the JAC. Thank you. Jeanette. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Madam Nomini, in this uh, uh, vetting, we are looking at, the, at your suitability for the job and your competence for the job. Now, I want to ask you this question. One, you have attempted multiple times to become a judge in the Court of Appeal, or once maybe, and despite your impeccable academic credentials, an illustrious legal career, you have been bypassed each time. Did JSC provide you with answers as to why they did that? Or was it your last name? What could be the problem? Can you explain to us as a committee what could be the problem? My second question is, it's on in the record, it's on record. This country went through post-election violence in 2007, 2008. And you're on record, you say that l much later, that there is no evidence to charge certain people who are involved in that post-election violence. What else? made you make that decision? Can you explain to the committee why you took that decision as a, as, a, as a serious prosecutor, a distinguished prosecutor who is known for prosecuting people? Why did you take that decision? And my last one is, there are bills that have passed through this house that have been declared unconstitutional by the court. And some of these bills emanated from the executive with the participation of the office of the attorney general. What will you do to improve the quality of legislation coming from the executive now that you, if you are approved, you, be, you will become the attorney general? So that the issues of courts declaring laws enacted by parliament as, as a constitution becomes a thing of the past. I have those three questions as well. Thank you. Dr. answer them quickly. Thank you, sir. About the JSC, I think the positions were few. I'm not the only one who succeeded, but I believe that it was not my time, and my time was going Do to... Do they give reasons when they don't give you the job? They don't. They don't, sir. Okay. They don't. About post-election violence, and me having said that there was no reason to prosecute, I want to say that I chaired a task force three years down the line, to look at offenses that were committed subsequent to the post-election violence. The task force, the task force concluded a report that was presented to the Excellency the President, and after it was presented to the President, it was then presented to different arms of government to deal with the recommendations. But as far as prosecution is concerned, I chaired that task force as a prosecutor also, and I was expected to look at the evidence with the lens of a prosecutor, which requires me to be sure that before I can recommend prosecution, I have sufficient evidence, and it is in the public interest, and I have a reasonable prospect of conviction. I used the law as it was, and I applied it to the circumstances, and I did my contribution to the tax force, and whatever was presented to, the, to the, His Excellency the President was the result of the conclusion of the task force. That task force included civil society. Thank you. About bills going to parliament and the government losing 
or courts declaring bills or legislation unconstitutional. First and foremost, it is the work of the courts to do that. That is one of the duties that they've been given. And if they do it, they are not doing a wrong thing. We should ask ourselves, why then the notoriety? I believe that most legislations that we have come up with of late have been to comply or to operationalize the 2010 constitutions. Most of the contents of those bills contain new jurisprudence, not only to the executive, but even to the judiciary. I take it as a testing time. We are testing the constitution through bills, through legislation. Honorable Speaker and Honorable Members, a testament to this is that even in the Court of Appeal, there are issues that they've not agreed on, they have not given direction. It is a good thing for us to test a new legislation. It will be volatile for some time, but after some times when we have matured with the 2010 Constitution, then we, the law will be settled. But that having been said, it is a concern if bills are declared unconstitutional when the Honorable Attorney General has contributed to them. What I would do is to find out why they have been declared unconstitutional. Number two, I would make sure that as the Attorney General, I advise that wherever we come up with a bill, it meets the constitutional requirements as provided. Thank you. Now, Dukas uh, nominee will take a batch of 333, three, three, uh, starting with Isola, Posing, then on Kikaria, in that order. All right, thank One you. One question each. No preambles. Okay, please allow me to ask two. Um, chairman, no preamble. You have served in the AG's office uh, uh, before. Are there instances where the AG then advised the executive and the advice was not taken? What will you do in if this committee finds you suitable in the National Assembly and you advise the executive on different matters and your advice is not uh, taken? The second question is that there are areas or there are circumstances where cases have been lost in court, as you have said, but then the judiciary then orders compensation to the litigants. My question is, why should taxpayers carry the burden of the compensation while there is an officer in the executive whose decisions have occasioned the judiciary asking that that money should be compensated? And we have many litigants who've never been compensated that the judiciary asked that um, they get compensated. And lastly, the two-third gender rule. How will you make sure it is realized? We cannot selectively follow the Constitution on the matters that suit us, but on matters two-thirds we don't. I will not speak again later, so there's someone who has asked um, a question from the public, that in Kenya today, the holder of a law degree is not eligible for admission to the role of advocates unless they attend the advocates training program and pass their bar exams. Currently, ATP is only offered at the Kenya School of Law. And so there have been attempts to review the law that um, mandates this. And so there is, um, and the attempts have been received with different divergent legal view. What is your position on this? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Mind to the nominee, uh, the Office of Attorney General, is practical one, which is, Nominee, I want to know, or the people of Kenya, in assessing your suitability, we want to know what is your opinion or vision on these contracts um, or clauses in contracts that uh, a government entity enters with um, international companies. And in those, in those clauses, the clauses inside those contracts, and I've seen it from being chairman PIC, where Kenya lose money, they put a clause to say that if there's a conflict in that contract, 
that the arbitration or the legal resolution will be done, for example, in London. And yet, Madam Nominee, through the, the chairman, the money is paid is 100% is exchequer, which means it's our money. And our case in point is uh, GDC, where Kenya lost uh, hundreds of millions of money in London through something I call kangaroo court called arbitration, where people can agree to fleece people's money and agree. Or the arbitrations are legitimate courts within both our system and the international uh, systems. They cannot be called kangaroo courts. That's not a fair comment. I thank you, Honorable Speaker, uh, but that's my opinion. Uh, maybe it's different from the legal practice, but I found it a, a kangaroo court, Honorable Speaker, that just people sit down and agree. And I, uh, it's, 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 it's Kenyans, Madam, nominated through my speaker, has lost a lot of money through that process. So what do you, what's your opinion? Can we, have, can we change the law and have a contract, particularly where Kenyan money, which is exchequer, maybe if it's a loan, that's a different way. What is your opinion on that, Madam uh, nominee, so that Kenyans don't lose money as we lost through GDC? I thank you, Speaker, in that kangaroo court. Not being a lawyer yourself, we forgive you. <laughs> Go on, Kikaria. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, Chairman, <laughs> I have uh, this yes. question. Yes, uh, Jeanette. Speaker, I, I thought uh, Honorable Koseng is a lawyer. I saw him that time when we, we, we had uh, the cases in Hague. I saw him carrying a lot of documents and saying that he's filing cases in Hague. And he that is exactly what he was doing, carrying documents. <laughs> That doesn't make you a lawyer. <laughs> Go on, Dokas. Point about the speaker, but... <laughs> Go on, Dokas. Uh, sorry, Gikaria. Um, Chair, uh, there is this uh, review of the Constitution. There is a call for us to review uh, the Constitution, either be it uh, through the parliamentary initiative or the popular initiative, on some quarters, like not having even the opposition leader in parliament and things like that. And also the very thin line between, uh, like what happened just there recently, on a constitutional issue under Article 37 and the Public Order Act. Uh, maybe in your view, uh, Madame Nomini, what, in your view, are the sections that we need to look for in terms of uh, the constitutional amendment, particularly to be able to align some of those very thin lines between Article 37 and uh, the Public Order Act where you have to balance uh, the two uh, for us to realize. So maybe in your view, what is, which areas do we need to look for the amendment in the constitution? Thank you. Yes, Nomini, can you Ch deal? Ch Chairman, and my colleagues, my apologies. It has something to do with what I had asked. Mm -hmm. I just want to know the past costly AG advices to government, mainly driven by vested in-house manipulative cartels, especially in Treasury, and official systems operatives in huge government development projects. I'd like to know your view on that. Uh, you can respond to those three honorable members. Thank nice you, Honorable Speaker, sing, sir. But also don't call arbitrations kangaroo because they are not. Thank you, Honorable Speaker, sir, and members of this committee. I am not privy to any advice of an Attorney General under whom I served that was not taken by the Executive. As to what I would do if my advice is not taken, I take it that the Constitution provides that the Attorney General is the principal legal advisor to government in legal matters. I look at the President as a vision bearer of the whole country. As he receives advice from the Office of the Attorney General, he has to take into account other sectors because the law does not exist in a vacuum. He has to take into account socioeconomic matters, security matters, and I believe he not only gets advice from the Attorney General, but also from those other sectors. It is the culmination of all these advices from different sectors in which I have no expertise to give that the President of the Republic of Kenya would make a decision. 
if the President of the Republic of Kenya is the vision bearer and everybody under him is working towards achieving the vision of the government of the day, I do not see where there can be a conflict. Otherwise, for me, I would give efficient, professional advice, which is just, which is fair, which is objective, which is truthful, and which is in accordance with the Constitution. The lost cases in the judiciary, I think it is important for me to say that I am not able to comment on why specific cases are lost unless I am seized with the information. But I also think that it is the responsibility of the Attorney General to put in place mechanisms to mitigate loss. And where loss is occasioned deliberately by an officer to take action or to recommend action. The two-third gender rule. The Constitution provides that in all appointive and elective posts, one gender should not be more than one-third, two-thirds. I think this is an issue that has been litigated. This is an issue that is before this House. And I would be cautious in commenting on it unless I see what is before Parliament and what is in the Office of the Attorney General and the initiative. But I know that in the Office of the, Attorney in the, Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions, we have reached the threshold. Legal education and CLE. This is a rowdy place. Very, very rowdy. Very rowdy. And I say that because I live with some of those people. I have seen them. I empathize and sympathize with them. I understand that there are two task forces that are given reports to the Attorney General. Those reports are in the office of the Attorney General. And pursuant to those reports, there are two bills pending before Parliament to harmonize legal education, to set standards, accreditation. Because, Mr. Speaker, sir, I am told that in some instances, you go to an accredited university, but when you go to the school of law, you are not allowed or you are not admitted. I know these people are frustrated, and that is my priority, to go and look at these two reports, to look at what is pending in Parliament, and to make sure that we recall it back because this was three, four years ago, there could be some intervening factors to make sure that we, we are responsive. Because these people need a closure and they need to know. They legitimately expected that after learning law, they would be admitted. So I do agree, this is a very rowdy area. It is frustrating and it calls for priority. And it will be one of my priorities if I'm uh, accorded an opportunity to serve. At the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions, Having found that this was a problem, we created a cadre called legal interns. We tried to bring in people who had gone through the school of law, but for one reason or another could not be admitted because they were frustrated. In fact, we started by getting in 100 and we distributed them. But apparently that was not in accordance with what Treasury expected, so we had no money, so we stopped it. I also think that it is the responsibility of the Attorney General to relook at pupillage so that we can structure some pupillage mechanism within the executive, so that we can absorb some of these children. It is an area that, as an attorney general, as an advocate, and having been the Secretary of Public Prosecutions, I admit it is an area that needs urgent, urgent call. Thank you. I was asked about the vision. the vision of the office. Mr. Speaker, son, honorable members, under the Constitution of Kenya, the Attorney General is the principal advisor to the government, also represents the government, represents the government in court. At the same time, the Attorney General is supposed to act in public interest. It occurs to me that the Attorney General is wearing two hats. He is a lawyer, he is also a minister. But this public-facing 
public interest parts, part has not been very clear. Therefore, I vision to be an Attorney General who will actualize the vision of an Attorney General under the Constitution. Be a principal legal advisor to the government, represent the government efficiently and adequately, and at the same time, protect public interest, uphold rule of law, protect human rights, good governance and accountability. I will be a responsive Attorney General and a lawyer of the people. And I hope the Office of the Attorney General will work with all the peoples of Kenya in realizing our aspirations under the Constitution. When it comes to contracts which are eschewed, Honorable Speaker, sir, I don't have any information on this, but if confirmed, I would make sure that we come up with some stand, 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 uh, SOPs, standard operating procedures. We set standards and we make sure that the Attorney General is actually represented and reali reliably represented in the contracts from the beginning to the end. Because unless you look at the quality of the contract and you mitigate any loss or any risk, it is very difficult to succeed in the end. So there is a need for an attorney general to be represented from the beginning to look at the clauses to make sure that they are they are responsive to what we need and that they protect us. At the same time, should we feel that some of the clauses will be injurious to us, we could review. That calls for expertise and very professional um, state council. The third question was on constitutional review. Mr. Speaker, son, members, the Constitution is a live document. And within the Constitution itself, there are provisions for review, which means that there is room to review and amend the Constitution. However, the rule of law requires that all laws of Kenya are made by the participation or with the participation of the people. They must be clear, they must be available, and they must be able to be legislated. For that reason, it is only the people of Kenya who can say what they want to change in a constitution because they have to be part and parcel of the law. The officer of the Attorney General can just be facilitative. Having had our constitution for the last 15 years, I would agree with those who are saying we are now ripe to relook at the Constitution to see what is working or not working. And this was provided for in the Constitution and under the rule of law attributes. A law that is not working should be reviewed, should be amended so that it is responsive, so that it can speak to the times that we live in. So I will facilitate such. Yes. Thank you. Now we'll take another batch of three. Uh, let's start with uh, Robert Mboui, Owen Bayer, Murugara. Daoud, hold your horses. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. Uh, to the nominee, um, having worked in the office of the DPP, um, and noting that uh, after we did our vetting in 2022, some of the nominees who had criminal cases against them, immediately after they were appointed, those cases were dropped. Now, as a legal advisor to the executive, if approved, one of the newly appointed CSs, the one for cooperative, the Honorable Weekly Van Betsa Oparanya, he confirmed on oath while he was here that uh, the ESCC has been used as a political tool to, pr to frustrate him when he was not uh, in government. Now, I have uh, two issues that I want you to maybe make a comment on. First and foremost, why should ESCC be asked to give an opinion when it doesn't matter? Because the opinion given by ESCC did not matter in the vetting process, yet we have to fill those documents even when you apply for public office like a member of parliament. Two, um, what will you do about the government's, uh, what advice will you give 
legal advice will you give to the government security organs and legal entities or legal teams, ESCC, DCI, DPP, on politicizing and weaponizing their offices? And finally, how will you ensure that uh, justice is served to all those parents and uh, you know, people who lost their lives, who are injured and who lost valuable assets during the recent uh, demonstrations? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Speaker. Uh, uh, you know, this nominee, I've only seen her on TV and uh, newspapers. Now I have opportunity <laughs> to interact with her. Yeah. But I just want to ask this uh, question, Honorable Speaker. Drafting is very key, uh, especially on laws. And uh, that's probably the link between executive and uh, parliament is how those laws come in, having passed through uh, the AG's office. I, I have looked at your CV and I've listened to you. You are a very, you're a very good uh, litigant or prosecution, prosecuting lawyer. But I haven't seen your strength in drafting of laws, which is probably one of the key areas that uh, uh, we will need to have in that office to avoid this idea of losing cases as government and uh, passing bad laws. I haven't seen that as strength on your, on your CV. Uh, so how will you really uh, help this country moving forward in terms of good laws and uh, good legislation. Uh, secondly, uh, a lot of these laws that have gone to court have fallen on the sword of uh, public participation, which is a key tenant in, uh, in the Constitution. And everything that we do right now, and every person who goes to court and says there is no public participation, even when public participation has been seen to be done, judges rule in favor of those litigants. What is, public what is the correct public participation to you? Or what are you going to do to, 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 to protect parliament and this government from that? And lastly, if you allow me, Honorable Speaker, if you look at uh, Section 43 of the County Government Act, it is very clear that the Attorney General may assist counties in matters apart from criminal cases. That is what uh, Section 43 of the County Government Act says. And actually it goes back to Article 156.4 of the Constitution. But county governments have been using colossal sums of money to hire lawyers without regard to the fact that the Attorney General's job to actually defend county governments. How are we going to stop this hemorrhage of money from county governments through payment to lawyers? I know the lawyers are listening to me and may not be very happy about this, but it is a tenant in there. Yeah, in the, the room. <laughs> <laughs> it is, There's uh, one next it to is, you. Is, <laughs> it is that. Monumental amounts. You look at Nairobi County government. They are running uh, billions in terms of uh, legal fees. And yet, it is the duty of the Office of the Attorney General to, to, to assist counties in legal matters. How are you going to, do you think we need a legal an instrument of law so that we can define the role of the Attorney General in counties? Counties are now setting up things called county attorneys, and they are basically lawyers in there at the, county, uh, at the county attorney's office, but they don't even go to court. They pay these lawyers, but then they pay external lawyers yeah. huge fees. How are you going to stop this? Because I, I think it is corruption. How are you going to stop it? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Nominee, the office you're just about to take over is a pale shadow of what it used to be and if we draw parallels, when it used to be held by Sir Charles Njonjo, the first black man to be the AG, and what you're taking over as the first lady, if you're approved by this house. Almost everything is lost. And recently, we had as parliament to try and salvage your position by returning the power to recruit staff back to you and in fact the same time also the AG was going to lose the only asset that was left under his armpit which was the public seal that tells you how eroded the office is as the incoming AG if you are approved what areas do you think should be recovered 
and returned to the office so that it is given um, the dignity that it used to have, which dignity possibly is now lost. Secondly, unsatisfied judgments are a nightmare in this country. If I'm not wrong, I think you owe Kenyans or the government owes Kenyans to the tune of about 1.6 trillion in unsatisfied judgments. What are you going to do about this? Or would you agree with me that we should be amending the Government Proceedings Act and open up government property to attachment by auctioneers to satisfy judgments that, that are unpaid? And lastly, the CLE, the Council for Legal Education, which I think is as old as legal practice in the country, which is started with those practices of article de clerks at the Kenya School of Law of the same time. Do you think there is any necessity of having CLE at the Kenya School of Law at the same time? Or should we now merge these two so that once you go to Kenya School of Law, you come out as an advocate, even if there are regulations formulated by CLE, but this idea of exams are by CLE, educational teaching is by KSL, is mis misnomer as far as we are concerned. What would be your position as regards those two dockets? And finally, as the AG, will you be prepared and can you tell Kenyans that you will actually stand up personally as a seasoned lawyer, litigator of many years standing to defend our government in courts? Because the reason why we have lost most of these case, cases, to be frank, is because you do not have experienced advocates there. Number two, those you sent are junior and possibly a missed meet to see some lawyers out there who sue the government. Will you stand up and defend that government personally? Thank you, Honorable Speaker, sir, and Honorable Members. I was asked why, why the EACC should give an opinion. Honorable Speaker, sir, and members, I think this issue of vetting is also murky. Because even at the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions, we get requests to clear people from different agencies. And we have been wondering on what capacity we would do that. So I would wouldn't want to comment on why the EACC is giving an opinion, but I would want to say that the whole procedure of vetting needs to be relooked at so that what we do is impactful and informs decision making. What I would do if cases are being weaponized and politicized? As far as I'm concerned, public officers act in good faith are required to follow the Constitution, to act in the public interest, and the interest of administration of justice. Whoever does the opposite is that, is not a public officer, is a criminal. I was told that drafting is very key. And I have not drafted any. When I was introducing myself, I articulated the legislations that I have personally led and have gone through this parliament and have never been declared unconstitutional. One, the Mutual Legal Assistance Act, the Anti-Corruption Legislations, the Organized Crimes Act, the Transfer of Prisoners Act, Cybercrime Legislation, the ODPP Act, um, the Process of Crime and Anti-Money Laundering Act, and several policies and procedures. And I can assure you that none of them has been declared unconstitutional. What is public participation? Public participation should be meaningful and impactful. As to what public participation should be is also a daisy area. And I think this is one area where we are testing our constitution. We have not come up with parameters of what is public participation. I think there is a need for a policy to give guideline or regulation on what public participation is. It might require a policy and then legislation because I think Kenyans must be given an opportunity themselves to say what they want to see 
in terms of public participation. But it is an area that needs urgent uh, consideration. And as we have agreed that our constitution is ripe for review, because it is provided for under the constitution, maybe this is one of those areas that will go back to Kenyans to relook at. Thank you. Um, the image of the Office of the Attorney General. Pardon? The question on the county. Yes. The, 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 the question on county governments. And the legal uh, fees. Uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, and honorable members, the impact of county governments is one of the areas that the interplay between the national government and the county governments is a bit cloudy. And should we have an opportunity to relook at our constitution, I think that is one area where we should put effort to see whether the objects of devolution are being achieved. From the perspective of the Director of Public Prosecutions, we also had that problem, where county attorneys were representing people or coming up with criminal laws without the participation of the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. So I think when we download the functions that are given to the county governments and the national government, there is need to give guideline on where the boundary is, how far they can go. Because if we don't act together, there's no unity of purpose, we act in cross purposes, then the person who is benefiting is the person who is the enemy of our country. So I think that is one area that we need to relook at. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, my question, last one, was not answered. Which one? Which is? Um, I just wanted, as a legal advisor of the, of the executive, and uh, we, the, we talked about, I just mentioned the issue of the recent demos and the people that were injured, killed. His Excellency, the President himself, talked about compensation. I wanted to get your comment on that and what advice you would give, My because apologies. the government would be the one that stands accused. My apologies. Go ahead. Honorable Speaker, sir, and members, as the custodian of people's rights, the Attorney General is also expected to uphold the rights of the people who have been injured and complainants and victims. I am aware that there is a Victims Compensation Act that has been legislated by this August House. There is an initiative to operationalize the Victim, the victim Compensation Board, which is under the office of the Attorney General. As a prosecutor, compensation of victims is a very important tool in the fight against corruption. Because many instances we have complainants who lose things. Either they are taken by accused persons or they are injured by people in government, but they don't get compensated. To buttress the gaps that I was talking about in the criminal justice system, I think the Victim Compensation Act and the Victim Compensation Board I'm sorry if I don't get the names right, that fall under the office of the Attorney General should be operationalized so that we give the parameters and the standards of compensation of victims. And that will also be a priority. Morugara's questions? Many short ones. So you can run through them quickly? Yes. The image of the office of the Attorney General. It is my vision that if I'm confirmed, I would strive to make sure that the office of the Attorney General is that office that is, des is described under the Constitution, that it is the people's lawyer. Whether or not I will meet that standard will depend on my actions. I have been given the tools, I have been given the legislations, and it is my hope, with proper support and the support of this House, we are able to make that office what it ought to be. Whether or not I will be able to go to court to defend the government, 
Honorable Speaker, sir, and members of this committee, I will lead from the front. About CLE, I'd already talked about it. And I wouldn't want to go into the nuances of the report, but I think this is one of the issues that is captured. So once confirmed, I will go back and relook at those reports and review the two legislations that are pending confirmed. before Parliament. If confirmed. <laughs> if, I'm sorry, my Lord. He, he almost made me think that I'd already been confirmed. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, sir. If confirmed, I will again go and relook at those two reports and look at the two legislations that are pending before this House, and it will be a priority, and I will be coming back to you with proposals, and I will be coming back to you to seek assistance. And you have helped me when I was in the office of the DPP. We couldn't have done it without you. Thank you. Big, big pending cumulative awards. Honorable Speaker, sir, and honorable members. I am informed and I know that some of these awards maybe are not big, but it is the interest that accrue, especially if it is compound interest. To enable me satisfactory answer that, once, if I am confirmed, I undertake to take an audit of what is pending, the reasons why they are pending, the challenges in satisfying the orders, and I'll be able to give a satisfactory answer. Thank you. Can we have Daoud, Honorable Mase, Honorable Mukami, uh, those three? Then we'll be left with uh, the remainder. Go ahead. Thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Senior Counsel, you just mentioned that constitution, you would consider constitution changes if possible. I want to put it to you because I've, gave, I've given to our speaker, I'm waiting for the legal counsel from parliament to draft it. Would you consider that because of the Gen Z's, particularly now, um, I have made a suggestion where we need to do away with the Senate. I have said we do not, we do not need to have governors, we revert back probably to uh, mayors of counties who would run the political uh, angle of the county, whereas the administrative would have uh, clerks like town clerks used to be there before. Uh, with that, then we establish a committee in parliament, uh, which in the National Assembly, by the way, when I say parliament, I mean just National Assembly and not the Senate where we would have a committee on devolution to take care of the counties so that we reduce all that baggage uh, which is there because basically uh, Senate takes care of counties which can be done by a committee of, parliament, of National Assembly. The same thing can be done. Would you consider something like that uh, to be feasible for change of the law? I know it may involve the referendum or something. Secondly, um, the Office of the Public Trustee, until three months back, I never knew they would do a succession case, which has been done. Uh, there was a property I bought from somebody and they had gone through a public trustee instead of going through the succession in court, which takes a lot of money, and time as well. But the problem was public trustee took more time than a succession course. Would you consider devolving all, if you are approved, the public trustee to each and every county? Because currently what is there in our region is in the, pro uh, the old provincial headquarters, that is EMBU. Would you consider and would you publicize it so that many people know that there is an office, uh, office of public trustee which can do those cases, and they're, I think they're practically free. They're not, there is not much involved in that. Would you consider that? Thank you. Thank you. Speaker, through you, my concern still goes to public participation. I know it's been mentioned, but I'm asking it in a different context. Nominee. The Attorney General's Office, 
is a lead coordinating agency on the realization of the draft Kenya policy and public participation. But uh, Kenyans are dissatisfied with the manner in which we conduct public participation. And recently, most of the legislators have suffered in the hands of our constituents because they feel there was no transparent and accessible public participation. Now, in view of the public expectations, what are your thoughts on public participation? Because as it, as it stands now, the committee conducting public participation sits in some boardroom or hotel in Nairobi, receives submissions from members of the public who are able to get to that venue, while those in far-flung areas are left with online avenue to send the submissions through email or, yeah, or whichever other means. So, in view of the dissatisf dissatisfaction by the public, what are your thoughts about how we should conduct our public participation going forward. Uh, my second concern goes to the Advocates uh, Complaints Commission and the, dis the Disciplinary Tribunal. Again, I put it to you that uh, many Kenyans are suffering in the hands of rogue lawyers. They receive benefits on behalf of the clients, they squander. They are given services and paid, they don't deliver. And it takes almost forever for these Kenyans to get any redress. Are these institutions effective? Or what are you going to do if approved to ensure that Kenyans get redress when they are, find themselves in these situations? Thank you. Uh, and thank you. Uh, thank you, Honorable Speaker. To the nominee, the weakest link in the fight against corruption is the pro uh, prosecution of persons accused of uh, economic crimes. Uh, the other day, again, I went to Nyeri prison, and I realized that the most poor people, the young mothers, those who don't have lawyers uh, to represent them, they are the ones who are lotting in jail. And yet, they have petty crimes. I would really like to know what you are going to do about it, if approved. Thank you. Nomini, answer those three. Thank you, Honorable Speaker, son, Honorable Members. As I had said before, we exercise liberal democracy by the people and for the people. And the rule of law requires that when we make laws, people must participate in making of laws. The laws must be available. The laws must be accessible. It is therefore my submission, Mr. Speaker, sir, as to what should be changed in the constitutional review, constitution or reviewed in the constitution will depend on what Kenyans will decide. I would therefore be happy if part of those recommendations are part of the things that Kenyans would recommend, then they will take the natural legislative process. I'm not able to answer as a person because the process has to start from the people. But if accepted, they will be part of what will be reviewed. The Office of the Public Trustee. It is not that I will do or whether I will do if approved to this position, I am aware that the cabinet has directed the office of the attorney general to decentralize to the 47 counties. I am aware this is one of the people facing departments whose services are required to the lowest level. It will therefore be my responsibility and priority to make sure that the public trustee department is devolved and decentralized. Secondly, there is a need to conduct public education and awareness on the services being rendered by this department. If approved, I undertake from the first week to put in a mechanism where the Office of the Attorney General will conduct cafes. We did this in the, from the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions where every Friday would have an ODPP cafe 
where the uh, deputy directors, prosecution counsel, and even experts from outside would educate Kenyans. So I will approach it from the purview of strategic communication. I will involve the media, civil society, and Kenyans, and make sure that the services of the Office of the Attorney General are taken to the people, are unknown to the people. I also know that the rule of law requires that laws and procedures must be available in a language that we understand. There is a need, Mr. Speaker, sir, so many years after independence, all criminal laws and procedures and all laws are still in English. People cannot access them. Deaf people cannot access them. There is a need for us to make that law accessible in a manner and in a language that can be understood by the people. So there's also a need to make those services understandable and accessible in a manner that people can understand. Thanks. Uh, speaker, I just want clarification on the constitutional amendment which I've spoken about. Yes. Uh, the nominee. Okay, he asked whether you will support a constitutional she, amendment. Uh, yeah, she has said yes. it has to come from the public. So are you telling us that as legislators, we, if we bring that constitutional amendment, if it is approved through the speaker, that it may not, it may fail because of it has not originated from the public. Both the honourable member and the nominee, the process of amending the constitution is defined in the constitution itself. It can't be any different. You can bring a constitutional amendment bill. You can go by way of pop uh, popular initiative that will lead to a referendum. So none of you is limited in what you can do, okay. except that it must be done in accordance with the constitution itself. Okay. Because she it just mentioned what it would be done through public participation only, no, if, I'm not, if I heard her right. Did you say that, nominee? Honorable sir, Honorable Speaker, sir and members, I said it has to be by the people and the House represents the people. Go ahead. I was asked about public participation. Riding from the recent court case, we have been guided that public participation should be meaningful and impactful. As to what should be public participation is where the problem is. And as I had said before, there is a need for us to come up with standards and involve the public to come up with standards and expectation of what public participation should be. And once we have that, we'll be able to direct and make sure that every legislation goes through the envisaged standard and, standard and um, expectation of the people. Honorable Speaker, if I can. Hey, maybe if I can, I rarely participate at this level, but I want to ask you, what we are grappling with is we have bills that go through the bicameral process. Starts from the Senate, ends in the National Assembly, and vice versa. If you find favor and you become the Attorney General and the principal legal advisor to the government, assisting all institutions, including Parliament, what would be your view in a situation where courts are striking out legislation on the basis of public participation, but you'll find that a bill emanating from, say, the National Assembly has gone through the entire hog of public participation. Going to this, let me give you an example. We had the sugar bill. Came from the National Assembly. The committee went to all the sugar growing areas, Ramisi, Rongo, uh, Awendo, Mumias, Mohoroni, Miwani, uh, Nzoya, all over. Picked views. The bill is passed, goes to the next house. Again, they pick it and embark on the same journey. Going to Miwani to talk to the same people that the National Assembly talked to, and so on and so forth. Would you, if you found favor and became the Attorney General, engineer a legislation 
that will give a threshold of public participation and find whether public participation by one house is public participation deemed to have been done by the other house except where there are gaps? Or what would be your thinking? Yes, uh, Emas. And, and uh, Honorable Speaker, it will become even more cumbersome because going by the recent pronouncements uh, by the Court of Appeal while invalidating the Finance Bill 2023, now Parliament is obligated to do public participation on each and every amendment even to an old bill, treating it as if it's a new one. So now we're asking ourselves, what exactly should this public participation entail? Are we going to to be going back to the people every time we're doing each and every small thing. I think that needs serious clarification and thoughts. Uh, Honourable Speaker, uh, if you uh, allow me to uh, uh, in on this. Some issue? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, Namini, uh, thank you that you're a, uh, you're a lawyer of good standing. Uh, probably you can help this country. Um, public participation. I, I read the judgment on the finance bill. They said we introduced new clauses on the floor of the house which is actually the reason why third reading happens, you know, and uh, no, the committee of the whole house, where we debate and, you know, say, you know, let's change this, let's change this. But a court says we should not, we should not do that, you know. Every time I have a, an, an opportunity to introduce or to change a clause on the floor of the house, I have to take it to public participation. Then now, come I, back again. Uh, I take judicial notice that that matter is now it's pending before yes. the but Supreme Court, court. and yes. therefore yes. it's sub yes. But I, I also want to... But you can talk about public participation in general terms, in, uh, because the process consumes public resources and yes. public time. Yes. When is public uh, participation adequate for purposes of legislation? Yes, on the same. Also, speak and we have a situation where one. every judge, every judge now has his own set of what public participation should be. And therefore, uh, they, they, they bring out judgments on oh, this is not public participation. And yet another court somewhere ruled out, ruled on what public participation should be and should not. Uh, uh, you are a good lawyer of good standing. I want to give that to you. How do you help this country? Nominated from uh, Honorable Posing. Right you know, here. that is a very emotive area now sure. because it is causing a lot of rampers all over. Posing? I agree with you, uh, our senior, uh, our speaker, that it is a very uh, juicy area, particularly this of public participation. Because, and it's good that the, the, the nominee here is likely to become the next Attorney General should she find favor or pardon. Don't prejudge. <laughs> If, if approved by if, if, if found, for, okay, yeah. Yeah, she might be, Speaker, you don't know. I don't know also. <laughs> but what I'm saying, Speaker, this might be an opportunity for her to listen to us uh, as the people of Kenya that that public participation thing needs to be thought about very cl clearly so that it doesn't uh, uh, curtail the role of parliamentarian. Because then if you say everything is public participation, including amendments at, 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 at the committee of the whole house, which is provided for in Article 95, so uh, what is going on? So I think, Honorable Speaker, this is a very juicy matter that uh, the, the nominee, should she get a favor of parliament, should dive into, as I call it, a low-hanging fruit. Otherwise, we will be confusing a country in terms of legislation. Nominee, can Thank you, you Speaker. Uh, Thank you, Honorable Speaker, sir, Honourable. and members of this committee. Adequate or meaningful or impactful public participation will be pu public participation that corresponds with the requirements of the Constitution. Constitutionalism requires that if there are provisions in the Constitution and we need to practice them and to promote them, there has to be guidance in form of regulations, legislation, and policy. And that is the reason why it was my view that, that there is need for a policy because from the seat of the executive, or if I'm confirmed as the Attorney General, it would be my duty to propose a policy to cabinet and to Inst instigate a process of policy making with a view to legislation, then the legislation will come before this August House. So there is a need for regulation through policy and legislation. If you find favor and become our Attorney General, that is one of the milestones we would look to you to assist Parliament. Within what period do you think you can be able 
to give the country a public participation act, regulations and rules. If approved by this house, yes. and if appointed and sworn in to serve in the capacity of the Attorney General of the Republic of Kenya, 100 days. We'll we will hold you to that if you get there. Yes. yes. May I answer something about the Advocates Complaints Commission? Yes. The Advocates Complaints Commission is also under the office of the Attorney General, but the Disciplinary Tribunal is not under the Attorney General. There is a need for the Office of the Attorney General to review the capacity, the structure of the Advocates Complaints Commission because they only have one panel that is sitting now. If approved for this post, I would also think that there is a need for us to sieve the cases that go through the Complaints Commission so that the very trivial ones do not clog the system. We only deal with the more complex ones. But otherwise, there's a need to take an audit and come up with good resolutions on how we can structure the department. Thank you. Are all the questions answered? Okay, so we can now move your question. I which my one? Questions. By Honorable Mokami, I think it was about uh, the mothers and uh, uh, vulnerable people who are in prison. Is it? And the fight uh, against corruption, yeah, in the economic uh, crime. Do you remember it, nominee, or do you want her yes, to repeat? Yes, I do remember. Okay. Yes. About the mothers, the young people, and the children who are in custody, they are clients of the Director of Public Prosecutions, but the Director of the Public Prosecutions is using the tools that are available to him. So issues of expediting uh, hearing of cases, issues of um, making pretrial detention shorter, legal representation, are not within the purview of the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. And that is the reason why, as the Attorney General, this is an area that I'm passionate about. I am going to do all it takes to come back to this parliament to persuade you that we need to relook at our criminal justice laws. I do not think, from the heart that I wear, that we are achieving the purposes of punishment, being retribution, rehabilitation, and restoration. Is the prosecution the weakest link in the fight against corruption? I was asked. The criminal justice system acts as a chain, and each one of us has a role to play. I know that the sector has been suffering from capacity, budget reallocation, sometimes inadequate or insufficient investigations. If approved as the Attorney General, I will bring in other tools to help in the fight against corruption. One, we would strengthen the operationalization of Chapter 6 of the Constitution by clarifying what government agencies can do. We will use the forums that we have, like the NCAJ, where the Attorney General sits, to review the process of hearing of corruption cases. It has to be shortened, and I'm happy to report that as a prosecutor, I know the president has recommended shortening of the time that uh, corruption cases should be had. There is also a need for us to use a tool called asset forfeiture and confiscation so that we take out the profits from the accused persons. If that tool was used, we'll make crime to be less attractable, attractive to the accused persons. We will also try to share resources and enhance the capacity of the officers. So each of the criminal justice sector agencies is suffering from something, but if we work together collaboratively, supported by this house, we'll be able to put in mechanisms to deal with corruption. Thank you. Yes, uh, Honorable Mishi, Honorable Russell, and Honorable Mule in that order. 
Yeah, thank you, Honorable Chairman. Honorable Chairman, before my question, I also want to add what uh, our nominee has just said, that it is one of the areas where, she's, she'll, she, if approved, she's going to put some reforms on the issue of presidential pardon. Because what we have been seeing, it is done politically. Those who have demonstrated that they have reformed and they need to have that presidential pardon, they don't access that. So while you say you have a passion on that area, on the prisoners, please also include the issue of presidential pardon. And Honorable Chairman, my question will also be on corruption, but in a different angle. And I just want to say that despite that we have so many laws regarding corruption, what are you going to ensure that there is consistently enforced? Because the problem here is enforcement or rather implementation of the laws which have already legislated. And on the same perspective, how are you going to protect whistleblowers and witnesses who come forward with information about corrupt cases? On the same breath, one of the areas which we have found, there is a lot of corruption and wastages, it is on public procurement. So how are you going to ensure that you protect public funds, you also ensure there is transparency, there is accountability, so that at least the issue of austerity measure can be achieved. I thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Honorable Mishi Raso. Honorable Raso. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Uh, Madam Senior Counsel, you rightly said justice is expensive. And indeed, it is in our country. Uh, our courts or our judiciary bo borrow heavily from other jurisdictions. When you look at America, they have the People's Court, uh, trial by ju uh, jury. Uh, these are many areas that actually make it uh, that the citizenry are able to access uh, justice speedily. Uh, if you are confirmed, uh, would you find it uh, favorable to have battery of lawyers in the state law office that Kenyans actually could uh, go to the state law office uh, and get uh, counsels or advocates who can uh, represent them in court uh, in actually uh, at a fee where many Kenyans are able to uh, access justice. Uh, secondly, it is in the area of court reforms. If you look currently, there are many emerging issues, cyber crimes, uh, cryptocurrency, crime, uh, uh, bullying on the internet. There are many things that today is facing the world, and Kenyans are not exceptional to that. Uh, if you are confirmed by the House, would you find it uh, uh, favorable to actually have new courts that address these frontiers? Uh, those are, these are teething issues to the Kenyan. And finally, what is your opinion on alternative dispute resolution? Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Stephen Mule. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, uh, thank you, nominee. The, the Office of uh, Public Trustee operates within the, uh, the organizational framework of the Division of the Administrator General in the Office of the Attorney General and the Department of Justice. Despite this, the public has limited access and knowledge of the public trustee uh, services. Uh, what initiative are you going to put in place uh, to communicate to the public uh, to offer services from this office? And you know very well, uh, the President has been on record saying that there has been very poor communication on what government is doing, it can do, to the public. I want to hear your views. Nominee, you can answer those three. Presidential pardon, honorable speaker, sir, and honorable members. I was privileged to chair, on behalf of the Attorney General, presidential pardons for about 10 years before the power of mercy committee. 
I can assure you, honorable speakers and honorable members, when I chaired on behalf of the Attorney General, we did what was required under the law. The power of mercy committee falls under the office of the Attorney General. I would expect that the power of mercy committee acts in accordance with public interest, good governance, and in the interest of the administration of justice. From the information given today, if confirmed or if approved, that is one of the areas that we'll relook at on what legislation or how they dispense their mandate. The issue of corruption. Honorable Speaker and Honorable Members. Corruption has been defined and corruption is a crime. The Director of Public Prosecution prosecutes what has been taken to him by investigating officers. The law requires him to either prosecute, to order further investigations, to take back or to close. I want to assume that whichever action that he takes, it is done in the public interest and in the interest of the administration of justice. Tools like whistleblower legislation are very important in the fight against corruption. I am informed, I am aware, that a whistleblower legislation is underway and that will assist the fight against corruption. I am aware that the Witness Protection Agency is in place, but it lacks capacity. It was a department within the office of the DPP, but it was made independent. It is contributing to the fight against corruption and organized crime, but it lacks capacity. Since the Attorney General also superintends the Witness Protection Agency, we will review the structure and the requirements and the challenges of the Witness Protection Agency, and together with other justice actors, we will come back to you on the way forward, because I think it will still need budgetary allocation. Justice is expensive, and we need court reforms because of emerging issues. Honorable speakers and honorable members, we have emerging issues in criminal law and civil law, political and economic laws. However, issues like cryptocurrency have not yet been legislated or regulated. As we speak today, I am assisting a neighboring country to come up with regulations on virtual assets and virtual asset providers, which include cryptocurrency. I hope that if approved, or confirm to my position, I will use my expertise to recommend to government that we need regulations and laws in the new emerging areas. But we also must encourage alternative dispute resolution because it provided for under the Constitution. They, to some extent, produce quality justice where court is not involved and where the parties agree to go to alternative dispute resolution. And that is the reason why when it comes to criminal law, I was also speaking about alternatives to prosecutions that can be embraced, including diversion, deferred prosecution agreements, alternatives to trial, let's say plea bargaining, but in a way that it satisfies the administration of justice and public interest. Thank you. About public trustee, I had spoken about public trustee, but it is one of the services that, if confirmed as the Attorney General, as a quick win, we will make sure that it is, um, it is uh, cascaded to all the counties, 47 counties, and I hope that the Director of Public Prosecutions will be good enough to share his resources with us, even if we start with this one, because it will decrease the number of cases that go to court, and it will shorten the time within which we resolve issues. I also know that the public trustee is, about to, is supposed to help mediation in inheritance matters, but since they are not on the ground, they cannot do that. So it is a very, very important service that should go to the people. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to follow up on what Honorable Rahab talked about women. And uh, there is something I was bringing, but uh, it was declared unconstitutional. A penal code, would you consider 
because she has talked about women in jails and women go with young children to prison, would you consider bringing legislation to remove the children from the prison the under fives? How would you take it so that we do not have women uh, who are serving sentence uh, with children under five in, in the prisons? Uh, Chair, part of my question has not been answered. Which one? Uh, this is about the wastages on public procurement. And Chairman, I've asked this question because I'm just looking, I'm putting a reference on what happened during the COVID-19 period, whereby we lost a lot of billions of money in terms of purchasing of masks. And I don't know whether how, as an AG, you're going to be advising the government in terms of public procurement. So I've not had any answers from her. Uh, thank you, Honorable uh, Speaker. Uh, Senior Council, my follow-up question, which you did not really answer, is the issue of legal aid to have battery of lawyers in the state law office so that many Kenyans can access justice uh, so that uh, lawyers are affordable and uh, individuals can approach any court. It doesn't matter who they are in society. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Speaker, there's someone who has asked me to ask this question and I think it's a fundamental one. Uh, nominee, under the Office of the Attorney General Act, Section 15, the Solicitor General shall assist the Attorney General in the performance of the duties of the Attorney General, and it prescribes how. What do you think, if the Executive or the pr President um, overrides you or works directly to get advice from the Solicitor General and not from you, if you are um, uh, approved by this committee and the National Assembly? about women in prison. Honorable speakers and honorable members, I know that women sometimes are detained in prisons and they have children. And I talked about the conditions of detention of vulnerable people within the criminal justice sector. It is not only women, but if you go to police stations and prisons, you'd hardly see detention facilities for children, for women, for men, demarcated, even for the disabled. So there is a need to relook at the whole criminal justice sector and the conditions of detention so that we can dignify people who go through them. Wastages of public, um, under public procurement. Honorable Speaker, sir, and members, public procurement is one area that gives birth to many cases of corruption. There is a need to ascertain that all MDAs and government institutions adhere to the requirements of Public Procurement Act, and it is the responsibility of the Attorney General to advise them on how to adhere to the requirements of the legislations. So it would be my duty to advise the MDAs and government agencies on what is required of them, should we find that the legislation is not adequate. For example, I know that under the Public Procurement Act, Section 134, contracts of above five billion are the ones that are approved by the Attorney General. The rest are done by the MDAs, but sometimes they end up to be the ones that have been more impactful negatively. So there will be a need to look at the whole of that regime and see how effective we can be. About the SG, I think if I'm confirmed as the Attorney General of the Republic of Kenya. I take the view that the Attorney General is the head of the functions that are proscribed under the Constitution. The structure and how the Attorney General's office will work will depend on how a particular Attorney General structures. Because if you are an assistant, you are an assistant, everything goes by, with, and on the signature of the holder of the office. So it will depend on the structure. But if the functions are given to you by legislation, then you are answerable to them. So I think it will depend on personalities, 
not really, but the law as provided under the constitution and legislation and regulation, and again on the structure and how the two offices work practically. Yes, thank you. Do you think the law uh, should be amended? Uh, no, I mean, yes, Mary. 